All right. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Jessica Gable. I am the West Coast Media Relations Officer for Food and Water Watch, and I'll be facilitating today's event and introducing our panelists. We'll reserve the final 15 minutes of the press conference for questions from the press, so please hold all questions until then. Our panelists today represent Indigenous, local, state, and national organizations. They come from advocacy, policy, and community organizing backgrounds, some live in communities who would be directly impacted by hydrogen development, but have never been consulted. All are here to loudly and publicly oppose Governor Lujan Grisham's proposed Hydrogen Hub Act that would make New Mexico a center for the production of fossil hydrogen. So we have a lot of excellent panelists today, so let's go ahead and get started. Our first panelist is Mario Atencio. Mario is a DNA from the Eastern Navajo Agency and a board member for the DNA Citizens Against Ruining Our Environment organization. He is a key member of the Protect Greater Chaco Coalition. Mario, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Um, appreciate the time. Uh, uh, yeah, my name is Mario Atencio. I'm board and I uh, really want to lead off with that um, hydrogen that um, in the greater Chaco landscape, there are over 30,000 oil and gas wells and the, the impact, there's just been a gargantuan impact of oil and gas in the region. Um, over 90, over 94, 95% of the landscape has already been uh, leased out for oil and gas drilling. And so what, and so, and lately in our efforts to protect Greater Chaco, uh, President Biden recently may had a, an executive order that, um, an executive order that put in uh, protections in, within 10 miles of the Greater Chaco landscape, but also demanded that any assessments of new development outside the boundaries need to be reassessed and um excuse me while I'm going through my 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 uh my slides here um and so within that um we see that the toxic waste impact of oil and gas especially gas um is a clear and present danger to the health of the land the air the water and the secret health of the people hydrogen hub only props up a dirty, toxic gas economy. And that being said, we need new ideas and not cracked, fracked gas. And so overall, we see <clears throat> in the landscape that everything that these oil and gas wells are just going to be locked in place. As it stands, the process to, to develop the landscape, integrated chocolate landscape, is, a, is very colonial and racist. Um, uh, BLM and the area should not even think of multi-use. They've always been completely dominated by oil, by the oil and gas operators. And so that being said, this is just going to keep the hydrogen hub would keep that racist colonial policy in place. And um, overall, even the and we just had to leave with this and saying that the governor really needs to rethink this boondoggle. And so with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Mario. I really loved um, what you said about needing new ideas and not the racist um, colonial attitudes that have wrecked this landscape for so long. Our next speaker is Jonathan Alonzo. Jonathan is the policy lead with Yucca. Jonathan, thank you so much for being here with us. Yes, we can hear you, Jonathan. Take a me one. There we go. Okay. Um, I'm having really horrible Wi-Fi issues this morning, so just please bear with me if uh, if you guys hear me breaking in or out. Just just let me know. Okay, Jonathan. I think we might have just lost you, so we will give Jonathan some time to. Oh, I think I think he's Jonathan is back. Okay. 
Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do my best. My Wi-Fi is being very difficult. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Juarez Alonso. I'm 19 and I'm the policy lead with Yucca, which is a project of Earth Care. Um, and yeah, I'm from the Pueblos of Laguna and Isleta, but I'm zooming in today from unceded Tua territory here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So as New Mexico continues to lead the world on a path towards total climate attack, Looks like Jonathan is having some more Wi-Fi issues. All right, so let's give Jonathan some time to sort out the connection issues here. And um, I Mike, here for New Mexico's. Let's go ahead and let's hear from our next panelist while we sort out the issues with Jonathan's audio and video. So I would like to introduce Mike Eisenfeld. Mike works for the San Juan Citizens Alliance in Northwestern New Mexico. He currently serves as the organization's energy and climate program manager, and he has worked with the San Juan Citizens Alliance on environmental and energy issues for 15 years at community, regional, and national levels. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this. Um, our organization has about a thousand members in the Four Corners area. And um, one of the premises that um, we feel is really important here is that um, this would perpetuate the reliance on fossil fuels. Um, the hydrogen hub is just not really a well thought out um, uh, process uh, at this point. It just seems like it's a shiny, flashy object that's sort of been thrown in front of people without any thought whatsoever about what the impacts would be to, to communities that are already overwhelmed. By energy development. <clears throat> uh, one of the things I think that some of us on the call are very aware of is the federal mismanagement um, and lack of accountability on oil and gas development. Um, for example, we've been waiting for seven years for um, the BLM and Bureau of Indian Affairs to analyze development of oil and gas, particularly uh, Manca Shale um, in northwestern New Mexico. This is a responsibility to analyze the impacts um, for 4 million acres. And, um, you know, it just sort of perpetuates this idea that, that uh, um, this area is going to be relied on for more um, oil and gas. And our area, we're trying to kind of transition um, from uh, being um, an energy um, export zone. Um, hydrogen would require extensive infrastructure that hasn't even begun to be analyzed. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that is just really disappointing is that it would be further subsidization for fossil fuels. Um, we kind of hear a lot that um, that the economics of uh, oil and gas um, are, um, you know, basically um, free market, but um, these subsidies just are not, not good. The last thing I want to sort of uh, talk about is that um, there's been no meaningful opportunities for consultation on, on hydrogen and the federal policies and the state policies. Um, there's a lot of interest up here for uh, consulting parties and cooperating agencies for any federal analysis. Um, the multi-jurisdictional landscape up here mandates that there's gonna be permitting. Um, we haven't seen anything yet on the hydrogen. Um, again, for frontline communities, um, the state and federal responsibilities um, are, are very extensive. And uh, our organization uh, will definitely want be wanting to participate in uh, public involvement and opportunities to evaluate what the hydrogen fossil fuel connection is. And uh, we will definitely be wanting to see what sort of alternatives are available um, because this, again, will just perpetuate our reliance on fossil fuels.
Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And thank you. I think that's the key point here, that hydrogen is connected so strongly with fossil fuels, that hydrogen production just enables the expansion of fracking of these dangerous extractive policies. Our next panelist is Julia Bernal. Julia is from Sandia Pueblo and the director for Pueblo Action Alliance. Pueblo Action Alliance is a Pueblo indigenous grassroots organization campaigning against oil and gas, false solutions for climate change and the protection of water. Thank you so much for being with us, Julia. Good morning, thank you, Jessica. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Julia. I'm, you know, from Sandia, and um, I'm here to give our a statement on behalf of Global Action Alliance. And and so our, our organization has stood firm against all false and greenwash solutions um, since even before COP26. We believe that this isn't a um, equitable or viable way to decrease fossil fuel emissions. Um, and so hearing endorsements around net zero um, does not mean real zero. Um, and our bottom line is no more fossil fuel extraction um, anywhere um, um, on our ancestral homelands. And so um, our organization, we, we've continued to stand um, in solidarity with frontline and other indigenous communities who are directly impacted by the climate crisis, which ultimately is perpetuated by the global fossil fuel economy. And so this year, you know, coming out of COP26, indigenous people across the globe mobilized um, against all odds, really, to speak out against false solutions like carbon pricing and trading or carbon offsetting and other types of energy investments that are um, essentially created or, or invested into to crutch the fossil fuel economy. And so uh, hydrogen production is, is a part of that, um, is a part of that greenwashed, uh, is a part of those greenwashed solutions. And so um, today on, on this presser, we, we remain in solidarity with the entire indigenous global struggle who have, continue to fight against false solutions. And so, you know, I encourage other environmental organizations to join our efforts as we, um, as we, you know, the Chaco Coalition, and um, we represent communities that are directly impacted by climate change. And we have also worked with other frontline and indigenous organizations across the globe to to uh, solidify this narrative. And, and we believe that we must follow the lead of those most impacted and, and not endorse any top-down uh, approaches because um, it's, it's not uh, community-based solutions. And, and so as a collective voice here today, we don't support the governor's hydrogen proposal. Um, we believe that developing hydrogen hubs will create um, even more stress in our already strained waterways and systems because um, you're using water as feedback to um, to uh, steam methane or or other types of fossil fuels that have to be burned in order to to undergo this splitting process to create hydrogen and so it's not a clean energy. Um, and, and we don't believe that um, this is a this is an equitable solution for climate mitigation. Um, so uh, again, you know, we're we're a part of um, a coalition of indigenous peoples um, who have advocated to end fossil fuel extraction, especially in the Chaco, uh, the Greater Chaco Canyon uh, landscape. And we all believe that hydrogen is a continuum of the fossil fuel economy. And so stakeholders, Pueblo nations and other indigenous nations um, must consent to these new industries and, and assess like how they will continue to impact our ancestral homelands. And so again, I, I encourage other organizations to not endorse net zero and to work with on the ground organizations and indigenous communities to um, create and promote those, um, those real solutions that achieve real zero. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, it's wonderful to hear your perspective and wonderful to get 
um, a sense of the international indigenous perspective as well, and to have to really debunk the industry narrative that these are that hydrogen production is a solution to any energy issue because it's not and it is a perpetuation of those same fossil fuel extraction um, policies that have been so harmful to communities on the ground our next panelist is reverend david rogers reverend dave is the pastor of the first christian church in carlsbad where he has served in the community for over 20 years Living in the Permian Basin, he experiences firsthand the ecological, human, and environmental toll of the oil and gas industry. Welcome, Reverend Dave. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and to all the members of the press, thank you for uh, being a part of this press conference today. It is greatly appreciated. Um, just a minute ago, Julia mentioned the uh, um, the COP26 and the, the global effect of the uh, indigenous populations out there across the globe. In 2019, I had the opportunity to attend COP25, the UN climate conference that was held in Madrid, Spain. And I could speak firsthand as to the indigenous uh, peoples from all over the globe in the sacrifice zones where oil and gas is uh, basically taken right out from underneath them without any regard to their health, to their safety, to their indigenous lands, to their culture, to their heritage. It is a global problem. And what we're trying to do is find solutions that uh, eliminate this problem. Hydrogen may think it's green, or we may be told that it's green, but it's, it's not. When I went to the UN in uh, 2019, I addressed the, the UN in specific terms, referring to the Permian Basin as an up and coming climate bomb because of the amount of uh, uh, stuff that was being vomited into our atmosphere and to the uh, degradation of our water supply. I was also there to say that the infrastructure in the Permian Basin was inadequate for the industry as it was. And when the day would come, when the industry would bottom out, the infrastructure was inadequate to handle the industry falling apart. I was called alarmist at the time. But then in April of 2020, the bottom did fall out of the market and suddenly all of those abandoned wells became twice the problem they were when they were at least somewhat being regulated. We have called all along for, for um, responsible, reasonable regulation because we are tired of depending on the industry to regulate itself. It does not regulate itself. That would be like, uh, you telling the electric company that you want to pay whatever you choose to pay for your electric bill and let them not have anything to do with it. Um, when we talk about the global climate change and the issues that we're facing in the Permian Basin, the big problem that we have is that the industry is inadequate to regulate itself and the state is inadequate to regulate the industry and it allows tremendous issues to go unchecked. Then you add to this, this scientifically implausible, filthy fuel source uh, that is covered up in a nice green blanket. It's still garbage underneath that blanket just because it has a green cover. And we think that there are many, many more uh, viable solutions to uh, getting away from fossil fuels rather than using fossil fuels simply to create something that has the illusion of being green. Another issue that we're facing here in the uh, Permian Basin is geological, it's earthquakes. And um, I've got some photos we're gonna put up on the screen here in just a moment to show uh, a map from the US geological website. That is a map of all of the earthquakes that happened in the Permian Basin from 1950 until 2010. So that is 60 years worth of earthquake data right there. The next slide is just the earthquakes that happened in the Permian Basin in 2010, so 11 years ago. This final slide is 
just the earthquakes that have happened in the last 12 months. And that shows you not only the color as a greater intensity, but also the frequency. These are not earthquakes that are caused by natural geological faults. These are earthquakes that are caused by fracking. And it shows the degradation of the environment uh, is so extreme now that even the Texas Railroad Commission is ra uh, raising alarms for the safety of their, their transportation systems because of the increase in, in the earthquakes. So in conclusion, I just want to say this is a serious climate bomb issue. Bringing hydrogen to the table is not going to solve the climate bomb issue. It is only going to accelerate it. What we have to do is find clean energy, green energy, not garbage wrapped up in a green blanket and sold to us as a bill of goods that really only props up the industry of oil and gas that is destroying our planet. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Reverend Dave. What a perfect way of describing hydrogen as a climate bomb, because it truly is. And thank you also for um, bringing up the important geologic ramifications of fracking. Our next panelist is my colleague, Jim Walsh. Jim currently serves as the Senior Energy Policy Analyst for Food and Water Watch. He works with state and national organizations to educate decision makers on strategies that help facilitate a rapid and just transition away from fossil fuels. Thank you, Jim, and welcome. Thank you. Um, Governor Lujan's hydrogen hub will make New Mexico the center of a massive web of fossil fuel infrastructure that is central to the oil and gas industry's plans to profit at the expense of New Mexico communities. Hydrogen will continue fracking and fossil fuel infrastructure and will continue making New Mexico a sacrifice zone to this destructive industry. The oil and gas industry is facilitating a myth that hydrogen is a clean burning fuel that is central to addressing the climate crisis. This is another misleading lie among a long history of misinformation perpetuated by the fossil fuel industry. The industry ignores the full impacts of their hydrogen build out to dupe and mislead the public and about the real dangers posed by hydrogen itself. Now, this is a common tactic the industry uses to mislead the public, focusing on a narrow set of circumstances and pretending like other facts and impacts don't exist. The fossil fuel industry lied about fracking poisoning drinking water, they lied about the impacts of fossil fuel development on our climate, and they are lying about hydrogen. They are lying outright, but they are also lying through emission. The hydrogen hub will create more sacrifice zones and continue harms on frontline communities around the globe. The fossil fuel industry plans to inject hydrogen into existing pipeline networks that will burn in existing power plants and gas infrastructure and in buildings, as well as build new pipelines, new tra tra hydrogen transportation infrastructure, and plans to export hydrogen around the globe. This necessitate significant new pipeline infrastructure envisioned by the industry, facilitating and creating transportation for hydrogen around the globe. Each of these projects will have their own localized impacts on air and water quality and public health. The fossil fuel industry ignores the impacts that this new and existing hydrogen infrastructure will have on local communities, as well as creates new markets for fracked gas necessary for Governor Lujan's hydrogen hub. The industry ignores the fact that burning hydrogen creates six times more NOx emissions than burning gas. So when the industry proposes blending hydrogen into existing gas networks, they're proposing increasing pollution on frontline communities near power plants that would otherwise be phased out. These NOx emissions will also impact indoor air quality for households who cook and heat their water and their homes with gas. The industry ignores the climate impacts of hydrogen production, which is worse than burning coal. There is no one who would suggest that building out more coal infrastructure would be a solution to our climate crisis, but that's exactly what Governor Lujan is doing by proposing this hydrogen hub. The industry ignores the fact that the European Union is planning to build out infrastructure that will accommodate new international markets for fracked gas under the guise of hydrogen, leading to poisoning of communities in New Mexico to follow Europe's mis misguided fossil fuel-based energy plans. Governor Lujan's hydrogen hub is uh, based on fossil fuel industry lies and misinformation. The New Mexico legislature should refuse to build out Governor Lujan's hydrogen plan that will prop up fossil fuels at the expense of our communities and continue making New Mexico a sacrifice zone. 
the legislature should prioritize New Mexico's communities over the profit motives of the oil and gas industry by passing a ban on fracking in New Mexico and ensuring a rapid phase out of fossil fuels and fossil fuel infrastructure. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you for the national perspective, the international perspective, um, and for really just solidifying this, um, for really making clear the connection between fossil fuel infrastructure and hydrogen infrastructure, and how you really cannot escape the pollution that a hydrogen hub would bring to New Mexico. All right, I think that um, Jonathan's internet issues are hopefully a little better. So let's go ahead and introduce Jonathan again. Welcome back, Jonathan. Thank you so much for bearing with me and I apologize again for my internet issues that have been very chaotic this morning. So hi everyone, good morning. My name is Jonathan Juarez Alonso. I'm 19 years old. I'm from the pueblos of Laguna and Asleta, but I've grown up here in unceded Tewit territory or Albuquerque, New Mexico my entire life. And I am here today as the policy lead for Yucca, which is a project of Earth Care. As New Mexico continues to lead the world on a path towards total climate catastrophe, our elected officials remain wrapped around the fingers of the same industry and CEOs who are destroying our planet in the name of short-term profits. As many of us saw firsthand this year, water, water reservoirs across our state are hitting record lows. Yet 2021 has already been a record-breaking year for New Mexico's oil and gas industry, which averaged a mind-boggling 1.16 million barrels of crude oil and 6.19 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day in March of this year. Both the oil and gas industries saw a more than 10% increase in production since February of 2021. And in April of this year, our state netted $109 million from oil and gas production, the highest profit in the history of, this, of the fossil fuel industry here in the state of New Mexico. At the same time, our state shatters oil and gas production records. Our elected officials claim to be leading us towards a sustainable future and a green economy, but this couldn't be further from the truth. Rather than listening to the demands of young people across our state, which were hand delivered directly to the desk of Governor Grisham in 2019, our elected officials are proposing dangerous false solutions like net zero by 2050 pledges and hydrogen power. Now, why am I calling hydrogen and, and net zero false solutions? Well, there are several ways to produce hydrogen, but almost all of it currently in production still relies on fossil fuel extraction. This process called steam reforming breaks methane down into hydrogen and carbon dioxide. The, uh, this most commonly results in what is known as gray hydrogen, <clears throat> or what if technology is used to capture the carbon dioxide produced in the process, it becomes known as blue hydrogen. That's what's being proposed here in New Mexico. But this is a distraction from the proven technologies that are cheaper and scalable right now, wind and solar power. Blue hydrogen might be economically competitive with renewables in 2050, but that's not the case now. And it's not fast enough to match the pace of decarbonization that the world's leading climate scientists say we need to accomplish in the next eight years in order to avoid cl catastrophic climate conditions. New Mexico already has the affordable solutions we need to swiftly, de swiftly decarbonize our economy now. Meanwhile, the oil and gas industry is once again trying to disrupt this process, this time with their methane polluted blue hydrogen. These bad ideas are just the latest of many greenwashing facades being pushed by the financial beneficiaries of the fossil fuel industry to protect their profits. Make no mistake, they are designed to distract us from taking meaningful climate action, and they're designed to keep the money flowing to the same fossil fuel industries that have spent decades destroying our planet in the name of short term profits. Governor Lujan Grisham may be lauded as the model climate leader after attending COP26 uh, in Glasgow with President Biden early, uh, a month ago or so, but the reality on the ground here in our communities bears scrutiny. The challenge at the hand is clear. The latest 2021 IPCC report published just a few months ago by the world's leading climate scientists stated unequivoc unequivocally that we, need, that we are at a tipping point. And it was a clear mandate that we need to cut global emissions in half within the next eight years. Now, while our state's democratic leaders are talking about their plans to transition our transportation sector or invest in renewable electricity, reducing our extraction and reliance on fossil fuels isn't even part of their conversation. By choosing to champion false solutions like hydrogen and net zero by 2050, 
Governor Lujan Grisham is once again protecting fossil fuel CEOs who are continuing to line their pockets through the same extractive industry that is destroying our planet. Once again, hydrogen is not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. And 99% of hydrogen production in the US still relies on fossil fuels. This blue, hydro blue hydrogen facade only increases our state's dependency on oil and natural gas, the exact opposite of what we should be doing. After two years of inaction since Yucca's climate crisis demands were delivered to Governor Grisham, she is once again betraying the young people across our state who have the most to lose with the impending climate crisis threatening our future. This is a dangerous false solution, and I would strongly urge all of our elected officials in the state legislature to do your research and stand up for what's right. This isn't in the best interest of our communities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm so happy we were able to sort out your internet issues because what you said is so important. Um, today, we have heard hydrogen referred to as a green blanket and a facade. And I think that's so, um, so appropriate for this fuel source that would bring added emissions, added pollution, and added health issues and destruction to New Mexico's communities. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of our panelists today for sharing your expertise, sharing your experiences and your stories, having experienced the destruction that fossil fuels bring to communities in New Mexico. Um, and now I'd like to open up the floor for any questions from the press. We'll do this using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you do have a question, please pop it in that Q&A box. Um, and then I will read it and offer it up to our panelists. So if um, we'll, give, we'll go ahead and give any members of the press a few minutes to add their questions to the Q&A box. And in the meantime, I can go ahead and get us started with a um, quick facilitated discussion. So obviously we've heard a lot about fossil fuel industry disinformation, which is really behind this idea of hydrogen as a green solution or something that would get us closer to um, lower emissions. And we've heard that that's not true. But I'm wondering from all of you here, what do you think is the biggest lie that the industry has told about hydrogen? And I'll open that to anyone who wants to take the question. If I may, I think from my perspective, the biggest lie would simply be the fact that uh, there are some very minute occasions where hydrogen as a fuel uh, by itself can be uh, categorized as being low emissions. But the problem is, the lie is, the amount of environmental degradation that is created by processing and creating the hydrogen. That's where the dilemma comes in. And uh, you can have the most cleanest little burning thing that you have uh, created, but if you have destroyed half the environment to create it, it does not uh, have any value uh, in terms of, of a green energy source. So the, the lie is that this is a green energy. Uh, it's not green. The lie is that this is an alternative to oil and gas. This is not an alternative to oil and gas. This is a supporting of the oil and gas. And we need to be very clear about what we're looking at in terms of what it will cost us to get such a little bit of legitimately green benefit. The costs are not worth the expense. That is a perfect summary. Thank you, Reverend Dave. Um, my next question, oh, thank you, Mario. Yeah. My, my next question, um, is what is your biggest fear about hydrogen development in New Mexico? And Mario, I was actually going to go to you um, to get your take on this. Yeah, um, biggest fear um, on my lands in Councillors, New Mexico, um, they spilled 50,000 gallons of oil and uh, toxic aqueous waste. 
um, my greatest fear is that's going to become so commonplace that um, it's just going to be a, you know, a cost of doing business in the greater Chaco landscape. And so we still don't know what's in that water. And so you talk about, you know, in some places through T norming that uh, hydrogen development propping up the oil and gas facilities is going to irradiate the landscape. And it's very, um, that has huge impacts on not just humans, but all of the life beings out there. Um, so it's, it's, it's basically going to be point source pollutions for radioactive waste. And then, <clears throat> and then all the VOCs that come out of those wells. Um, and they're going to, they're going to do oil gas operators are going to put so little money into leak detection and repairing that, it, uh, Communities upon communities are going to be constantly microdosed with uh, uh, air toxics. And so that's my greatest fear for the long foreseeable future. Thank you, Mario. That's truly horrifying. And thank you for sharing um, that, that fear for hydrogen's impact on communities and lands. Um, Jim, I see you just came off mute. Yeah, you know, hearing um, Mario and and you know others talk about the impacts on on New Mexico is is truly tragic, and I think that I I fear that we will not only squander our real opportunity to address the climate crisis by following the fossil fuel industry's lies on hydrogen but that we will harm so many communities while we're building this industry lie, all for the profits of the CEOs and shareholders of oil and gas companies and the expense of, of sacrifice zones and communities that are treated like nothing other than a sacrifice zone for these profits. Thank you, Jim. I think that Mike also had a response to this. Yeah, you know, this hydrogen um, concept kind of came to the forefront about four months ago. And um, it, it's not just our governor, it's some of our um, senators and, and also the federal administration looking for sort of like quick fixes. But this is just an irresponsible approach. Um, our communities have been promised that we're part of an energy transition to um, what we believe could put us um, into a diversified um, economic situation that's been sorely lacking. And so uh, I was talking to um, one of Heinrich's staffers. It was telling me that um, you know, blue hydrogen is the answer because solar storage um, is 20 years out. And I basically said that uh, I felt that he had that reversed. And we need leadership. We don't need um, perpetuation of our reliance on fossil fuels that has just imposed such um, an incredible um, amount of pressure um, on communities that are already overwhelmed by public health impacts, methane emissions. Uh, we are the methane hotspot um, of the United States. Um, and I think the Permian Basin is, is uh, running in the same issue. Um, we're um, dealing with uh, <clears throat> basically being close to exceeding um, the ozone standards here. Um, this is an area that um, has already been um, impacted. And so um, we're asking for leadership that is real solutions. And I, I really um, highly respect Jonathan's points. Um, you know, for those of us who are um, trying to leave the planet um, in a better condition than it is now, I, I think it's really scary to think that this is okay um, in 2021. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mike. And we'll go to Jonathan next. Yeah, thank you so much. I think, um, you know, I have, I have two really big fears around this. And, and I think, first of all, is that 
the the public has very little idea what's going on. And I think, you know, that's obviously one point of, of why we're doing this here today. But just the amount of, of uh, hype and misinformation I've seen coming from, from the state's Democratic Party and our elected officials has been really concerning. Um, and secondly, and, and something that um, I'm sure a lot of us are aware of is that this has already happened um, and it's, it's really happening behind our backs. Um, I don't know how many of you guys saw the articles come out, you know, last week and, and the week before, but uh, Albuquerque based uh, biotech uh, already has plans to build at least 50 hydrogen hubs across the US and the United Kingdom in the next three years. Their first three hubs will be built in 2022, which is, you know, uh, 14 days away now, 16 days away. Um, they're gonna have two in Albuquerque in 2022, then they're gonna build 11 in 2023 and 36 in 2024. Um, and you know, a lot of these have taken place without public input and without public knowledge. So those are my two biggest fears is that one, you know, the public just won't be educated about this. And I, I think that's fully intentional. Um, and second is that, you know, this is already happening behind our backs. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, that's a very, very valid fear. There has been no consultation with the people that this will actually affect thus far. So we do have a few questions in the Q&A. So I will go to the first, um, and this comes from Jorge. Do we have any details of how much Governor Lujan Grisham's hydrogen proposal would cost taxpayers? Does anyone have an idea of that? I would not be able to offer any dollar figures, but I think it's important to look when we talk about costs, we have to look at the overall costs. And this is what I experienced living in the Permian Basin. The Permian Basin has a good reputation on the economic side for providing a lot of money for the state coffers. And it makes, it makes sense to lawmakers to go ahead and get as much money into the state as, as they can, that's what makes it popular. But what people don't realize is the incredible cost that comes out of that, the degradation of our roads, the degradation mm -hmm. of our environment, the loss of potable water going down uh, and become frack water. And then there's the, the human cost, the number of lives that have been lost into this industry through accidents and, and issues. There's also the health cost. We have some of the highest asthma, uh, emergency room asthma rates here in Eddy County, uh, and, and uh, cancer rates are up, people uh, are dying because of this industry. And when we talk cost, we can't just look at, okay, it's going to cost this much to produce hydrogen. We need to look at the bigger picture and find out the cost that we are extracting from human lives, from indigenous cultures, and from whole communities, because Eventually, if it doesn't stop, this place will be uninhabitable down here. And that is a cost that is too high to quantify. Thank you, Reverend Dave. That's just a perfect way of encapsulating the true cost of this proposed hydrogen hub. Um, the livability of New Mexico will be the cost. Um, so we do have another question in the chat, um, and this comes from Scott Weiland. Um, please give your thoughts on green hydrogen, separating hydrogen from water and using renewable energy to fuel this process. So I know that we probably have some panelists who can speak to this. Um, Jim, would you like to, would you like to answer this? Sure. We, we should be very cautious about hydrogen development in general, no matter what the source. The way the fossil fuel industry talks about hydrogen development is the idea of a hydrogen economy. And the reality is, is hydrogen has very little role in the transition to a clean energy economy. It is possible there could be very discrete and specific uses for hydrogen, but it is, it is not something we need to be developing now or today. This is a last mile of the transition technology. And developing green hydrogen is not without its, its problems, particularly for communities like New Mexico, where you're facing significant droughts. The green hydrogen production takes tremendous amounts of water. Green hydrogen production also takes tremendous amounts of energy. 
and is inefficient to use in any sources where direct electrification is already possible. The use of hydrogen for um, an, our energy system uh, moving forward should be very significantly evaluated before we start building out any infrastructure. And that evaluation should not just look at the cost, but also look at the full impacts on our communities. Because this um, hydrogen also is very dangerous to transport. It is very highly combustible and explosive. And so we should be very careful about that. The water usage is very hard. And it can also hinder our ability to transition to clean energy because communities will need to actually then compete with hydrogen production rather for, for clean energy resources, rather than building out those resources to directly electrify homes and businesses and communities. This can actually increase cost of the transition to clean energy for particularly having a, a disproportionate impact on low income and moderate income homeowners and, and renters uh, who don't have the resources to even afford uh, clean energy at its current prices. And so before we build out any hydrogen, no matter what color the industry wants to, to call it, we need to spend significant resources having entities like the National Academies of Science actually study the actual appropriate uses of hydrogen if it should even be used at all and fully evaluate the impacts of hydrogen development of whatever source would be used um, for in our energy system. That hydrogen also, if it is utilized, should only be utilized in fuel cells because burning hydrogen, as I mentioned earlier, actually creates worse air quality problems through the production of NOx, which is an ozone precursor and also causes significant health concerns. And so we should be very cautious about this development um, on the whole and take time to study the impacts of, of hydrogen development before we rush to follow the fossil fuel industry down this rabbit hole of problems. Jim, thank you so much. And you've hit on such a good point that um, the enormous water required for hydrogen production, even green hydrogen, is a huge cause for concern in New Mexico. Um, so Julia, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, sure. And of course, um, uh, the panelists today did mention our issues around water security and water storage in this region. But um, because of climate change, we are experiencing rising temperatures, and this is causing an extreme impact to our, um, our snowpack, our snow accumulation, and our headwaters. So the best way to store water is when it's in its snow form. And so if we're seeing less and less of snow accumulation, then we're gonna run into issues around um, excessive evaporation rates and other types of stressors to our watersheds. And so it doesn't really make sense to invest in a energy production that is heavy on our water resources. Um, $8 billion of federal dollars is, is, you know, going towards energy investments. A lot of the energy investments is technology that, that doesn't even exist yet, or it's technology that hasn't even been tested or proven to be efficient, proven to be clean. And so instead of putting dollars towards towards energy investments that we're not sure about, um, investments in like solar and wind could definitely um, help with our stressors to our water resources because um, the big question around this hydrogen hub is what, what's the source of water going to be? Is it going to be groundwater? Um, and if so, how is that going to impact um, um, in-stream flow to our, our main tributary here? Um, this is also a concern that the that the Pueblo should be um, should be included in as well because uh, six middle Rio Grande Pueblo tribes have prior and paramount water water rights. Is this industry going to impact those very senior water rights? Um, these are a lot of questions that need to be answered before um, deals are signed and before they're. Um, before the development of this hydrogen hub right next to Sandia Pueblo. Um, and so I just feel like our state priority really needs to be around um, what types of climate resiliency strategies are gonna be implemented in the Rio Grande Basin and how are we going to um, use other types of uh, you know, funding to, to figure out how we're gonna store our water um, as we experience um, rising temperatures from climate change. So 
Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, we've only got about just under 10 minutes left. So I, I will go ahead and move us along. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the Q&A box, but again, I would invite members of the press to pop your question in there if there's anything else that you wanna ask. Um, so I will just keep the discussion going. Um, uh, this I, is Mario. <clears throat> Mario, please. Yeah, so th the question earlier about what it's gonna cost taxpayers, <clears throat> listen to Julia's remarks, it's gonna cost taxpayers right now $8 billion. It's unproven. <laughs> And there's no way that it's actually going to work. And by all means, it might just completely uh, cause toxic waste dumps and just increase all this huge environmental impact and public health impact. And so at, in the least, it's going to cost taxpayers $8 billion on, on top of the other um, impacts, as, as Reverend Rogers so eloquently put forth. Thank you, Mario. Really appreciate that solid dollar figure. That's an incredible amount of money um, to cost taxpayers when that money could go to actual renewable solutions like those that have already been mentioned, like solar and wind power. Um, my next question is really for anyone who wants to take this on, but um, if this hydrogen hub is allowed to continue, what does that do to hydrogen production across the nation? And what are the broader implications of that? Jim, do you wanna take a quick stab at this? Or anyone else? Um, sure. Um, so, uh, Jessica, can you actually repeat the question? Of course. So I'm wondering um, what hydrogen production in New Mexico means for hydrogen development across the U.S. Um, I know that Governor Lujan Grisham's goal is to make New Mexico a center for hydrogen production. So what does its development and propagation in New Mexico mean for the United States as a whole and um, for energy across the US. One of the primary objectives that I see of the fossil fuel industry's push for hydrogen is to create more markets for fracked gas, but it's also designed to undercut efforts to actually transition to uh, more electricity-based infrastructure for transportation, buildings, and electricity. And so this will this transition to hydrogen will, will mean more fossil fuel production. And what scientists are telling us is that continuing to build out fossil fuel infrastructure and not rapidly phasing it out means more destructive climate impacts. This means more fossil fuel pollution. We will see more droughts. We will see more wildfires. We will see more flooding. We will see more uh, impacts of, of tropical storms in, in the Gulf Coast and elsewhere. We will see these impacts continue to rise and increase until we make deliberate and real steps to transition off of fossil fuels. We will also see more communities harmed around the country by keeping dangerous and, and polluting uh, fossil fuel gas power plants online, we will continue a pollution burden and worsen a pollution burden on communities. We can actually transition away from these energy sources um, with adequate investment in clean energy and clean infrastructure um, and, and, and actually put forward plans that will transition us off of fossil fuels. So in order to do that, we need the governor and the legislature to stop buying into these fossil fuel industry lies, which do nothing but perpetuate the impacts of fossil fuels on our communities and, and the climate. Thank you so much, Jim. All right, we've got about five minutes left. So let's go to Julia. Um, yeah, just real quickly, just to add on what Jim was saying, I mean, this is essentially another market market based strategy, same thing as oil and gas production. Um, the more hydrogen that is produced on a national scale, then the cost of hydrogen will will decrease, you know, it's it's like about creating that surplus and so um, 
it's it's uh it's based on again this uh, global capitalist free market and that's why it's important for um solutions around climate mitigation to be community uh solutions or, or be community led and those solutions be coming from those mostly impacted and so again um this is a market-based strategy it's um it's been used for oil and gas, and it's going to be, again, that continuum of, of fossil fuel extraction. Thank you, Julia. All right, Mario, let's go to you next. Uh, national implications of this move show is showing the nation that um, how a democratic governor can thumb her nose in violation of her own state tribal collaboration act and put forth extremely impactful uh, economic uh, initiatives that really affect the, as I said before, prior paramount water rights in, in one of the most secret landscapes in, in the world. Um, really, you know, when it's something's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, that's, that's very important to, to highlight. And so what the implications are is like how, this is how uh, Democrats are only less aggressive than Republicans, but this is showing how you know, uh, the swashbuckling uh, governor, Luhan Grisham, can really uh, throw away, throw around the weight of the state in, in, in obvious um, defiance or not even defiance, but not even acknowledgement of the tribe's sovereign, um, the tribes and pueblos and nation sovereignty. So thank you. Thank you, Mario. I think we have time for just one more response. So I know, um, Reverend Dave, you had a thought, please go ahead. I just wanted to point out one of the things about this hydrogen that we need to understand is uh, brought up by the idea of having the surplus, developing the, the hydrogen economy and so forth, the, the, the market-driven approach. A lot of this is very dangerously tied to a narcissistic nationalism that believes energy policy and I should say falsely believes that energy policy and energy independence is essential for national security. And it's oftentimes uh, whitewashed as this whole patriotic national security, all sorts of thing. But I wanna say what I said in Madrid, Spain, two years ago this month, what can be more devastating to national security than killing our people and destabilizing the global climate? This is a lie. We cannot buy into the hype, and we must put a stop to this. What a perfect note to end on. Thank you, Reverend Dave. We must put a stop to this. Thank you to all of our panelists, and thank you to the members of the press who joined us today. We really appreciate your coverage of this important issue, and we will definitely be in touch going forward. We'll be sending a downloadable copy of this recording to everyone who attended today. Um, please feel free to reach out with any questions or any interview requests. I'm putting my email in the chat for everyone to see. And with that, thank you very much. And we will hopefully see you again soon for another um, really edifying press event. Thank you.